So for a little background, I was 10 years old when this took place, and I lived in a smaller city in Northeast Ohio. I lived in an apartment complex, but the buildings were up and down duplexes, and there were multiple of them. I lived downstairs in one of these buildings. My dad was out of town for a couple of weeks, and the night this story took place, my mom was working. I have three siblings, and my next door neighbor was babysitting my two younger siblings, while me and my eight-year-old sister, who I'll call A, were at the same neighbor's house, hanging out with the neighbor's daughter. At around 9.30 p.m., A and I went back to our house. We were at home for about 15 minutes, until someone knocked at the door. We both just thought it was one of the neighbors. I told A to look through the people before opening the door. She did, and she then looked at me, and she was kind of confused, then telling me, I don't know who that is. I moved her out of the way and then looked for myself. I didn't know who it was either. It happened to be a man who looked to be in his 40s, maybe early 50s. He looked dirty and he was wearing a red flannel with a jacket over it and dirty stained jeans with dirty Timberland boots. I backed away from the door and both me and A were pretty confused. A opened the door but the man didn't say his name but then introduced himself as my grandfather's friend. He said that he knew my dad too. Me and A kind of laughed and then talked to him a little. We were trying to end the conversation so that he'd leave, but he then asked if my mom was home, and me being a dumb kid, I told him no. He told me he had talked to my mom earlier that day and that he wanted to come hang out with us and that he wanted to see my mom. I didn't know what to say to him, and I just told him, oh, well, she isn't here, so you can't. He then asked, well, why don't I come inside and wait with you guys until she comes home? I'm sure she wouldn't be upset. As soon as he finished talking, my phone started to ring, and I jumped because it kind of spooked me. I looked at the man and then told him, That's probably her calling. I'll ask her if you can come in. And I then shut the door and slowly locked it so he wouldn't know that I locked it. I also wasn't going to ask if he could come in, but it wasn't my mom calling. It was my best friend at the time who lived a few buildings down from me. Let's call her Jay. Jay had called and told me that her mom was on the porch and had seen the strange man talking to us, and that before he knocked on the door, her mom had seen the man looking through our windows. She told me that her mom called the cops already, and Jay asked me if there was any way we could get out and make it to her house. There was a way. I told A to follow me, and we went to the back of our house to our bedroom we shared. I opened the window, and I told her to go out of it, and then I went afterwards. I shut the window, and we went behind the buildings all the way to Jay's house without the man seeing us. When we were then inside of Jay's living room, waiting for the police and my mom to arrive, the police came before my mom, and they talked to us, and they then searched our house. But the man was gone. He was nowhere to be seen, not even around the apartment complex. They said they'd patrol the area and let us know if they find him. The police said other than that, they couldn't really do anything. My mom came home and she said about how earlier that day, before she went to work, that her and her upstairs neighbor went up to the store to go get some cigarettes. My mom took my baby brother with her and he was in the stroller. When they were leaving the store, a man came up to my mom and said my brother looked familiar and he asked who my dad was. Now, my dad's side of the family is really big and a lot of people know them and we all look alike. My mom only told the man that my dad's first name was Frank. The man then said our last name, which my mom didn't tell him, and he asked if that was our last name. My mom then kind of laughed at him and said yes. The man said he knew my grandpa. My mom didn't really say too much to him after that, and she said she had to leave because she had to go to work in a couple of hours. She said she had a really bad feeling, so that her and my neighbor took a few extra turns just in case. But he must have followed her home anyways, though. That night, me and all of my siblings just slept in the living room with my mom. I've never seen or heard from that man since, and I'm now 15. A couple of days after all that happened, I overheard my mom talking to her friend about it, and she told her how the next day she went to watch the cameras to our apartment complex, and at around 4 a.m., the man came back and tried to open every window, but they were all locked. 
I honestly really wonder what he wanted and what he would have done if I let him in that day, or what would have happened to us if he actually got through the windows that night. That thought really terrifies me. My name is C, and I'm an 18-year-old female. This happened to me when I was 10 years old. At the time, I would lived with my parents, and they weren't divorced yet. Some background information. I don't live in the US. I don't want to exactly say where I live, but I live in a country where there doesn't happen to have any serious crimes very often. Okay, so this happened on a Friday evening. My parents and two younger siblings had left the house to go shop for some furniture from Ikea. I didn't want to go with them, so I decided to stay home. I was watching some TV for a while when I decided that I wanted some candy because it's Friday and I was really craving some. I had put my clothes on and I walked down to the nearest store that wasn't even a mile away from my house. It took me like 10 minutes to walk there. So, because there's not really much crime here, it's not really weird for 8 to 10 year olds to walk to the store sometimes on their own. I got to the store and bought my candy and started to walk back home. When I was about halfway home, I had noticed a guy. He was riding a bicycle and he looked like he was drunk by the way he was swinging around on the bicycle. I just kind of glanced at him and he continued forward, but he definitely gave me the creeps. I started walking a little faster and at some point he had actually yelled something to me. I couldn't make out at first what he was saying, but I then heard some of it more clearly and he was asking for me to stop. I didn't and I started running. Even though he was on a bicycle, I think he was so drunk that it kind of gave him a hard time to catch up to me. We had a little forest beside our house where you could walk through and get to our house a little bit faster. So I started running as soon as I heard what he said, and I turned to the little wood path, and a little bit after I had turned, he rode right by it, but then noticed me running down the path. He yelled something at me again, but this time I didn't turn around. I then ran home and opened my door and locked it behind me. We had two giant windows in our living room where you could see straight out to our front yard. I didn't turn any lights on, and I very carefully walked to the living room. I was breathing heavily and my chest was hurting from running so fast. I had never experienced anything like this before. I walked to the living room and I carefully peeked between our blinds out to the front yard. I almost fell backwards when I noticed he was standing just behind our door. He noticed me move the blinds and started knocking on the door. I had no idea what to do at this point. I thought that maybe I should call my mom and tell her what happened. My heart was racing and I didn't know what I should do. And then by pure luck, our neighbor came home. The guy at the door noticed the car coming, and he then walked back to his bike and took off. When my parents came home, I didn't tell them what happened. I don't really know why, but I just decided not to tell them. This is one of the most scariest things that has ever happened to me. This isn't something that really happened to me very often, but it really did scare the hell out of me. I did tell my mom years later what happened, and she was horrified by it. The following events took place around May of 2009 when I was about 18 years old. I was a senior in high school at the time and was also on the football team. Oftentimes, our school would always host games at least a few times a month, and it would also be this major event that a lot of students attended. Because we had so many games, it wasn't a big surprise we had practice almost every day. As much as I hated football practice, I really enjoyed the sport and liked the amount of support my teammates and coach gave us. One day, I had came home from practice and found a note from my mom letting me know that she went to go get groceries and that she wouldn't be back till later. With me being practically drenched in sweat, I go upstairs to grab my towel and turn on the shower. I take really long showers, so when my parents aren't around, I go mental. I was probably in there for about a good 20 minutes or so when I hear the front door open. 
We have one of those smart locks which makes a loud beeping noise whenever somebody enters the house. The bathroom is directly above from where the front door is and I could still hear it even through the thickness of the walls and the running shower. I turn off the shower and put some clothes on and go downstairs to see that the door was indeed open. Figuring it was probably my mom, I go outside to see if she needed help with the groceries, only to find out that her car was nowhere in sight. Alarms start going off in my head as the only people who knew the password were my mom and as well as our meter reader who comes once a month. Why my dad isn't with us is another story, but I then walk slowly back inside to see if there was any other signs of attempted breaking. I turned the corner into my kitchen and what I saw there chilled me to the bone. There was a man I had never seen before crouched down by our pantry. He was holding a large knife. By some stupid luck, he didn't seem to notice me as he was facing in the opposite direction. I covered my mouth with my hands and went back upstairs quietly to call the police as well as my mom. I dialed 911 and tried my very best to speak into the phone as quietly as I could even while hyperventilating. The operator had told me that I should stay hidden and not to come out no matter what. While on the phone with her, I hear footsteps coming up the stairs and not even 10 seconds later, I hear a steady and slow knock at my bedroom door. It was at this point when I began to realize that I was crying, but it was too late because I knew he was coming for me. Suddenly I hear my bedroom door slam open and I see the man step inside. At this point I'm trying not to make a peep fearing he'll hear me and kill me. What happened next is what I can only describe as a gift from God. I begin to hear sirens in the distance getting louder and louder as they came closer to my house. I then saw him leave my room and hurry down the stairs before hearing the heavy knocks on my front door and someone shouting police. After about a good minute, I run down the stairs and open the door and was greeted to three police officers that began to question me while searching the house. My mom also ended up coming home as quick as she could. However, the police never found the man. He had got away scot-free through our breezeway door which also had a lock. Police still weren't sure as to how he had managed to pick the lock and there was no other signs of break-in anywhere in the house. This happened when I was 13. I lived in a duplex with my dad and brother. It was a two-bedroom and I shared a room with my dad while my older brother had his own room. It was not uncommon for both of them to have plans at night while I stayed home to play video games alone. This night was no different. My dad was probably at some bar, and my brother, who knows where he was. I was playing the original Resident Evil on PlayStation, and at around midnight, my eyelids were getting too heavy, and I decided to go to bed. I slept with my bedroom door wide open. Now, not one time in the years that we lived in this place did my dad or brother come home by entering through the back sliding glass door. A couple times my brother didn't have his key for one reason or another and he would knock on my bedroom window and ask me to let him in. My dad always had his key and would always come home through the front door. On this night, I heard the back door slide open. It was an old door and sliding it open wasn't easy. It was also very loud so I heard it crystal clearly. I lay in bed wide-eyed, my imagination going crazy. I heard whoever it was walk through the dining room, through the kitchen, and then into the living room. They made no attempt to be quiet. After a brief silent pause, I saw someone walk by my bedroom doorway. This scared me so much as you can imagine, and my heart throbbed. Whoever was in my house walked into the bathroom right next to my bedroom and flipped the light on. 
The light poured into my bedroom, and I was laying there, terrified, completely exposed by the light from the bathroom. Why didn't I shout out for my brother or my dad? Because, like I mentioned, I knew it wasn't them, and there was no one else that it could have been that would have made sense. Not a family member, not a friend. I knew it was someone that did not belong. The person then walked out of the bathroom, left the light on, and went into my brother's room and started making a ton of noise. It sounded like they were searching for something. All I did was lay there, shivering. After a few more minutes, the person walked by my bedroom again. I expected at any moment a stranger would walk into my room, but they didn't. I heard them making noise in the living room, walking around, huffing and puffing. Then they started walking back and forth by my bedroom repeatedly, into the bathroom and back out, over and over. At the time, I was 100% sure they were messing with me for some reason. They knew I was there, whoever they were. I heard the person making noises. By this, and by the huge figure that I saw walking back and forth, I knew that it was a man. They continued walking around each room except the one that I was in. And then suddenly, I heard them walk back through the house to the back sliding door, open it, and then leave. I lay there in bed, terrified, wondering what just happened. After a while, out of sheer exhaustion, I fell asleep. In the morning, I found that my dad and brother were both home. I have asked both of them dozens of times, and they both promise it was not them. Plus, again, why would they go through the back door and then leave again through the back door? This was 21 years ago, and I will never know who it was or why they were there. Nothing was missing either. What really makes me wonder to this day, why did they never come into my bedroom? The door was wide open, and they walked by it at least 20 times. I'm a 24-year-old female, and I had been living in a suburban area of a relatively large city in the U.S. Since the start of the pandemic, I had gotten laid off from my job and ended up falling behind on bills and keeping up with rent. Because it was so hard to find work during times like this, I often had to rely on my parents to pay for some of my expenses. With my parents struggling as well, it was hard for them to keep up with their own responsibilities, so I felt bad and would somehow make it up to them. One day, I had just gotten into a huge fight with my landlord about payments that were past due, even with him knowing my situation. Now, with me being upset and having a very bad day, I started texting my boyfriend just to see if he could cheer me up somehow. We start texting back and forth, and I eventually sent him a picture of me in an outfit that I thought looked cute. As soon as it was sent, however, his response was something that I wasn't expecting. Uh, babe, who's that in the background? At first, I was a bit confused, so I checked the photo again and zoom in to see a black figure peering out from my closet. I felt my blood run cold and didn't dare to turn around to see what was there. All the while, my boyfriend started sending me frantic texts asking if I was okay. I casually walk out of my room, lock the door, and run downstairs to get the security guard and explained everything, almost crying to him. Needless to say, we get up on the elevator and go to my room, and what we found there still chilled me to the bone. My closet door had been fully open as well as my window. However, this made absolutely no sense as I lived on the 7th floor of the building and there was no way that whoever was in my closet could have jumped out. I still don't know what to think of this experience till this day.
So this happened to me on Thursday, April 25th, and I still can't shake off how terrifying and strange it was. So I was home alone, getting ready for my 12 o'clock college class that morning, and I opened my blinds to let some natural light in. I glanced out my window to see a man in his mid-thirties wearing a baseball cap, roaming around my property with his hands on his hips, walking with a lot of weird confidence. Our yard is kind of like a cliff, and it looks over onto our five acres of property down below. I live in the PNW, so it's a pretty scenic view. I was really confused and thought maybe it was a worker that my mom had hired for our renovations on the house, admiring the view. I'm a little bit uncomfortable at this point, cause the dude walks to the side of my house, out of sight. I head upstairs to see him now roaming around my front yard in my driveway, looking at things, checking out my house, etc. He still hasn't seen me at this point. I call my dad and ask him if we had hired anyone to come by the house, and he says not that he knows of, and tells me that he's going to call my mom and ask her, and then call me back. I'm waiting for the cop when I notice this strange dude's car. It's a white Honda with no license plates, just parked parallel to my front door. The dude still hasn't seen me, and he's still wandering around, so I take this as an opportunity to remember that we have a security system, and I armed it, so that if he did try to break in, it would immediately alert the police. If this was some sort of professional or worker, he would have rang my doorbell or knocked at least once. He did neither. Just then, I get a call back from my dad, saying neither him or my mom hired anyone to come by today, and that I need to call our local police station immediately. I went back downstairs after making sure to lock every door and window upstairs, and called my city's police station. I explain to a woman on the other end what is happening, and she decides that she's not going to send an officer out, and instead gives me a number to call their emergency dispatch line and told me to talk to them. I call the number she gave me, and immediately I get an automated message saying, Thank you for calling the non-emergency hotline. Nobody is available to take your call right now. If this is an emergency, please hang up and dial 911. At this point, I'm really irritated, because 15 minutes has passed, and this weird dude is still lurking around my house while I'm home alone, and apparently, that wasn't enough to warrant an emergency to the lady I called at my local police department. I hung up and decided to call 911. After getting in touch with the 911 operator, I was asked a series of questions about his appearance before they would even alert officers near me to start heading towards my house. The whole thing seemed really weird. Nobody was in a hurry to have officers come up to my place when I was a younger girl home alone with a strange dude. I asked the officer if I could stay on the line with her when she finally, after what seemed like forever, alerted police to come to where I was. She agreed, and I went back upstairs to check on the weird guy, and he is now sitting in his unplated Honda, either listening to a radio show extremely loud or on a phone call with someone through his car. It was a very prominent, loud, male voice coming from his car. Then, all of a sudden, I hear the tone you hear when someone hangs up on you, and the operator was no longer on the line. I was really confused when my thoughts were interrupted by an unrecognized phone number calling me. I assumed it was the operator calling me back, so I picked it up. Instead, I was greeted by really creepy, heavy breathing. I am not sure who it was, but it really freaked me out. I hung up immediately and dialed back 911. I had been pretty calm up to this point, but that phone call put me in panic mode. I got on the phone with another operator who already knew my situation and address before I could even explain it to her. She said the cops were on their way. Twenty minutes had passed at this point. The dude is still here, in his car, and the cops aren't. Keep in mind I live in a smaller town, so there is no reason why it took the cops as long as it did to come down. Finally, this dude is leaving my driveway right as the cops pull in, and they stop him and ask him a few questions. A cop then comes to my door and hands me a sketchy-looking flyer saying, It was just a landscaper. He said he had an appointment. I was really relieved and irritated that it was just a dude my mom had hired. 
until I realized it wasn't. I called my mom back and said, the cop said that it was just a landscaper that you hired and that he had an appointment. My mom replies with, I can assure you we never hired a landscaper. We don't even need one. So, creepy dude who could potentially be posing as a landscaper to traffic people or rob their houses. Let's not meet. In December of the year 2000, two brothers by the names of Reginald and Jonathan Carr arrived in the largest city in the state of Kansas, Wichita. The pair hailed from Dodge City, over 150 miles to the west, and each had an extensive criminal record by the time they took their trip to Wichita. But their visit wasn't in good faith. It wasn't some road trip to sample the delights of another big city. Their reasons for being in Wichita were the very definition of malicious and predatory and it wasn't long before they decided to commence their malevolent mission. On December 8th, Wichita State University baseball player Andrew Schreiber stopped at a convenience store to buy some Skull chewing tobacco. Out of nowhere, the Carr brothers appeared behind him as he was returning to his car and forced him at gunpoint to withdraw money from ATMs until his card refused more transactions. Schreiber was fortunate enough to escape the encounter with just shot out tires, a few scrapes and bruises, and a depleted bank account, but others wouldn't be so lucky. Apart from a vague description of two male African Americans in their early to mid-twenties, police had nothing on which to base an investigation, and all was quiet for the few days that followed. Then, just three days later on December 11th, they invaded the home of 55-year-old cellist and librarian Anne Walenta. The brothers subjected her to much of the same treatment as Schreiber, beating her, robbing her, and taking their time while doing so. However, it appears the brothers underestimated Walenta, and she managed to escape from them, rushing to her car in an attempt to flee the scene. Tragically, one of the Carr brothers noticed her absence, following her outside before sending three bullets smashing through her windshield and into her torso. Knowing they were compromised, the cars took their turn to abscond from the house, while Anne Walenta would pass away from her wounds in a Wichita hospital bed just three days later. The car's crime spree was already horrifying in both scope and scale, but it wasn't until December 14th that the brothers would escalate their frenzy from a series of bloody robberies to theatrical levels of pain and suffering. On the night in question, the brothers pulled up outside a house at 12727 East Birchwood Drive in the Wichita suburb of Andover, which they later admitted to choosing at random. Inside were financial director Brad Haka, preschool teacher Heather Mueller, financial analyst turned priest Aaron Sander, local high school teacher Jason Beffert, and his girlfriend, a teacher known only in court documents as Holly G. The Carr brothers got out of their car, armed with golf clubs and pistols, and walked up to the front door of the home. One brother hid from view as the other knocked at the house, smiling and waving when he saw movement through a front-facing window. But when the door was open, the brother dropped his friendly facade, pointing his pistol in their victim's face before forcing his way inside. Once all five of the home's occupants had been corralled into one of the home's back rooms, the Carr brothers began to pillage their belongings. At one point, one of the brothers opened up a popcorn tin, emptying its contents and observing a small jewelry box that fell out. When he opened it, he found a diamond engagement ring, but instead of simply pocketing the ring and moving on, the brothers found the discovery to be highly amusing. They marched back into the room in which they detained the home's occupants and demanded to know who the ring belonged to. That's how Holly G found out that high school teacher Jason Befford was planning on proposing to her, not in a moment of joyous surprise, as it was intended to be, but in a moment of absolute dread and terror, as two strange men laughed in her face about it. Even with the diamond ring and a variety of expensive electricals, the Carr brothers were unhappy with their haul. It was then the brothers decided to take three of their prisoners to a series of local ATM machines forcing each of them in turn to max out their cash withdrawals. This bagged the brothers an additional $2,000, but still, they weren't satisfied. 
They drove their prisoners back home and then tied them up again. But instead of fleeing the scene with the cash and valuables they'd already collected, the Carr brothers decided to have a little fun. They began to torture the male prisoners from the group, beating them with their golf clubs along with a variety of household items. According to court documents, it's then apparent that one of the Carr brothers remembered how one of their prisoners was engaged to another and decided on a horrifically cruel form of torture involving both of them. One of the brothers dragged Jason Beffert into a position where he could witness the violation of his fiancée. The other picked his own female victim and proceeded to do the same to her. This horrendous torture and abuse went on for more than an hour, with the brothers taking turns to beat and violate each one of their terrified prisoners. When they grew bored of the violence, they packed their prisoners into one of their own cars and drove them out to the striker soccer complex on the outskirts of Wichita. As it was late at night, the complex was completely abandoned, and there was no one to stop the brothers from forcing their prisoners from the vehicle and marching them out into one of the soccer fields. They were lined up, forced to kneel, then each of them was shot execution style right in the back of the head before one of the Carr brothers drove over them in the truck they'd been driving. It's chilling to note that this obviously wasn't to finish them off, so to speak. They'd already shot their victims in the head. Running them over in a truck was evidently an attempt to mutilate the bodies as best they could before they fled the site of the murders. Yet amazingly, the Carr brothers didn't attempt to flee Wichita following such a shockingly violent crime. In fact, they didn't even leave the neighborhood. They drove straight back to the home of the victims they'd left lying in the snow and began to utterly destroy the place with their golf clubs. It was then that they found Holly's pet dog, Nikki, who had been so scared during the attack that she'd ran and hid under a kitchen cabinet. One of the Carr brothers enticed the dog towards him with some cold cuts taken from the home's refrigerator. When approached, he smashed it to a pulp with the golf club he was holding. Only when the home had been utterly ransacked did the Carr brothers even think to depart, but they did so safe in the knowledge that any potential witnesses had been silenced, and that in all likelihood they would never have to answer for their crimes. But they were wrong. Back at the striker soccer complex, blood-soaked tire-tracked bodies lay motionless in the snow, all except one. Holly G., though bruised and bloodied and battered, slowly began to open her eyes. She couldn't remember how she got into that snow-covered soccer field, nor did she recognize the bodies of the people lying next to her. All she knew was that she needed to find her boyfriend. She needed to find Jason. And that's how she ended up walking almost a mile in the freezing Wichita night, half-naked, bleeding and terrified, but still alive. Around a half hour later, a middle-aged couple were awakened by someone pounding at their door. It was 25-year-old Holly G., bleeding and half-frozen, and according to the homeowner, she apparently opened with, I need to tell you my story before I die. Miraculously, Holly G. survived the attack and would go on to positively identify both brothers using prior mugshots. Both were tracked down the day after the home invasion and were taken into custody following a long and volatile standoff with police. The local district attorney said that based on the evidence, the motive for the murders was robbery, yet he didn't seem to take into account that neither brothers seemed satisfied, even when they killed their victims. He failed to touch on how they returned to the house, not to erase any potential evidence, but to continue to destroy all they found. Regardless, thanks to Holly G's testimony, both brothers were convicted of nearly all 113 counts against them, including kidnapping, robbery, four counts of capital murder, and one count of first-degree murder. They were each sentenced to death for the capital murders as well as life in prison, with decades to serve before eligible for parole. Following their imprisonment, sensationalized news coverage of the Carr brothers' vicious crime spree created widespread panic in the greater Wichita area, resulting in a huge spike in the sales of firearms and state-of-the-art home security systems. The fact is, we live in a time when these kinds of crimes are relatively rare. Over the past few decades, violent crime has actually decreased in the Western world, whereas the reporting of it has increased in volume and intensity. It gives us the false impression that things are getting worse when in reality, data might suggest the very opposite. 
but it's also very true that we can never truly eliminate the dangers that lurk out there in the dark. There will always be monsters, there will always be evil, and sadly, there will always be innocent victims. This happened just about a week ago. I'm 20 years old and I live with my parents during the summer. However, they went out of town for some of their friend's wedding and I wasn't invited. This was fine with me though because I didn't really know the people anyways and it's kind of fun to have the whole house to myself. We have a split level house and my bedroom is at the front end of it. But on Friday night, I stayed up really late watching a movie in the living room. I like that TV better because it's much bigger than mine. The couch in the living room is also super comfortable, so I just decided to sleep there for the night. Anyways, I woke up Saturday morning and it was still super dark in the house. In the living room, we had a sliding glass door that connects to the deck in the back. The blinds were covering most of it and that's the main source of light, but there was maybe a five foot gap to look out and I saw that it was raining. I then looked at the clock and it was almost 9.30 a.m. I was just sitting there on the couch and turned on the TV when all of a sudden I heard two knocks at the front door. They weren't really hard knocks, sort of light, and immediately my heart started pounding. I know it's not a big deal just to get knocks on the door, but we lived towards the end of a dead end road and our neighborhood was very quiet. It wasn't very big and it was extremely rare for anybody to knock on our doors for any reason. Maybe it's also because I'm a shy person, but it made me really nervous for some reason. From where I was sitting on the couch, I was just barely around the corner and I couldn't see the front door. And whoever was at the front door probably couldn't see me. At least I was hoping they couldn't see me. I was wondering who it could possibly be, especially in the middle of pouring rain. Then I remembered something. I had ordered an Amazon package and was expecting it today. Suddenly, I felt so much better and started to relax. I opened up my Amazon app on my phone and clicked on my orders, expecting to see that it was delivered. But when I looked, it said it wouldn't arrive until 5 p.m. that day. Suddenly, I went back to being super nervous. I decided to carefully look out and see if anyone was at the door. It had now been maybe a minute or two since they had originally knocked, and they hadn't knocked again since. I slowly moved to look out the window, and when I did, I saw that nobody was there now. This made me feel a little better now that they were gone. But right at that moment, I heard the noise of somebody walking up the stairs of our back deck. I couldn't see because of the blinds covering most of the sliding glass door, but I then heard footsteps on the deck. I started shaking, and the next thing I knew, I saw a man appear in the opening of the sliding glass door where you could see outside. He was staring right at me, but had no expression on his face. He was bald and wore a black jacket and black pants. The guy then tried sliding the door open. Thankfully, it was locked, but I knew if he really wanted to, he could probably break the glass between us. I ran away into the bathroom that was just down the hall. I had no idea who this guy was or what he was doing here. I had been right to be so nervous about this for seemingly no reason. As I closed the bathroom door and locked it, that's when I heard the first loud bang against the window as if he was going to try to break it. I knew I needed to call the police, but then I realized that I didn't have my phone. I had left it back out in the living room. I heard another loud bang from the window, but I didn't hear glass breaking. I knew it was a risk but I opened the door back up and ran out to the living room couch. I looked around frantically and finally saw my phone. Then I made another mad dash for the bathroom. As I was, another bang came from the window. I looked back at the man as I ran. I saw he had been kicking at the glass and trying to break it. I got back into the bathroom and locked the door again. Then I called 911 on my phone. As soon as the operator answered, I told them everything. They told me to slow down and repeat what was going on. That's when I heard the sound of glass breaking. I repeated what was happening as best as I could. And just after that, I heard the sound of the man starting to walk inside the house. He was walking straight for the bathroom that I was in. When he got to the doorway, he tried the door and it wouldn't open because it was locked. I backed away from it and went into the shower. The 911 operator said that they would stay on the line with me, which made me feel a little bit better because I was terrified. The man then started to bang on the bathroom door, and my phone suddenly went silent. I looked at it, and saw that it had died. I hadn't plugged it in the previous night. I figured the man was kicking on the door the same way he had been kicking on the sliding glass door, and I knew he would probably break this as well. I heard him walk away for a minute, and then go down the stairs that we had. 
He was gone for maybe a full minute, and then I heard him return. There was another loud bang against the bathroom door, but this one sounded much harder. I think he had found one of the baseball bats we had in our house or something. This made me even more terrified than I already was. I grabbed the towels we had in the bathroom and covered myself. I then went into the small bathroom closet we had and closed that door. I just barely fit in there, but I had to do what I could. The guy hit at the door a few more times, and it really sounded like he was breaking it now. But that noise was interrupted by another one. It was the noise of a loud knock on the front door. I could barely hear someone shouting police. I hoped they would be able to get inside fast. And just after that, I heard the man walking away towards the back of the house where he had gotten in. I stayed hidden, and a short time later, I heard a bunch of shouting. Eventually, I heard someone yelling, put it down. When I finally heard the voice of multiple officers inside my house, I finally came out of the bathroom. They had literally gotten there just in the nick of time, and the man had been caught. I'm really lucky how fast the police were to arrive that day. This was very recent, and I'm still a little shook up about it, but I'm just happy to be okay. This happened many years ago, probably about 15, and I would say that I was about 10 years old. At the time, I lived with my parents and my older brother. I think it was a Friday, and I remember after getting home from school, my parents and brother were going to go shopping. They asked me if I wanted to come with, and I said no because I really wanted to play video games at that moment, and I wasn't really interested in going with. When they left, I figured they would be gone for maybe a couple of hours. I went upstairs to my room and started playing video games. It was kind of my after-school thing to do back then. I started it up, and my game hadn't even loaded yet, when all of a sudden I heard a noise coming from the hallway. It was the upstairs hallway right outside my bedroom. This was really strange, and I remembered I listened, but I didn't hear anything for a few more seconds. Then there was another noise. It was definitely coming from right outside my bedroom door. My door was already open, but not all the way, maybe three feet or so, so I decided to look out. I walked over to the doorway and leaned my head just out and looked. As soon as I did, I saw a man climbing down the ladder that we had which led up to the attic. I pulled my head back into the room. He hadn't seen me because his back was facing me when he was climbing down, but I just hoped he hadn't heard me. At first, I was really confused. I knew our house wasn't being worked on, so why was there a guy coming down from our attic? I heard him begin to walk down the hallway towards my door. As quietly as I could, I got onto the ground and slid underneath my bed. The man walked right past my room and then headed down the stairs. I got as far underneath my bed as I could and hoped that the man wouldn't come back. I heard him move around a little bit downstairs, especially because my ear was up against the floor. I was too scared to get up or move. It felt like forever that I was laying there. I couldn't call the police because I didn't have a cell phone back then. We had a home phone, but that was downstairs. In my mind, my best bet was to just stay hidden. I kept laying there, and I really have no idea how long it was, but I remember eventually hearing him walking back up the stairs. I closed my eyes and held my breath when he got to the top of the stairs. He once again just walked right past my door, and then seemingly went back up into the attic when things were quiet once again. I thought about leaving my hiding place, but ultimately was too scared. I remained there until I heard our front door unlock, and then heard the voices of my parents and brother downstairs. At that time, I ran down as fast as I could and told them what had happened. At first, they didn't believe me and my dad seemed to think it was funny. But eventually, when my dad went up into the attic, he said he immediately saw signs that someone had been up there. He didn't see the guy himself, but enough to know that there was somebody in there. He closed it and we called the police. We went outside and waited, and eventually, when the police got there, they were able to catch the man. He had been living in our attic for several days. We rarely went up to our attic or used it back then. It was just really a storage place for us. I don't know how the man didn't hear me in my room at first, but I always feel lucky that he didn't. I live alone in a small one-bedroom house. For me, it's the perfect size, and I've lived here for about a year. But shortly after I first moved in, I had a terrifying experience. I was sitting in the living room one night and watching TV. I was very comfortable on my couch, and I think it was about 10.30 at night. Out of nowhere, I started to hear a noise coming from the other end of the house. It was kind of quiet, 
It sort of sounded like it was coming from inside the wall. Immediately, I started to fear what I thought was the worst at the time, which is that there would be mice in my house. But I would eventually find out that it was something different. I turned the volume down on my TV to listen closely. Eventually, I did hear the noise again. I just couldn't quite tell what it was, so I walked over to where I was hearing it. I went through the end of the living room towards the pantry and then the attached garage. I realized that's where the noise was coming from. I could hear somebody walking around in there. I was a little scared, but I opened my garage door and looked around. It was a one-car garage and really dark in there. I turned on the light, which wasn't that bright, but I could now see. But I didn't see anybody at all. I looked all around and there was nothing. There wasn't really a whole lot of space, but the longer I had the door open and was looking around, the more freaked out I was feeling. I shut the door and then went back inside. I listened for more noise and just hoped whoever was in there would leave and not try to go in the house. As I was inside, I kept listening for a while, but I didn't hear anything else now, so I thought maybe looking in the garage had scared off whoever was there. Eventually, I was able to go back to watching TV and later got tired and went to sleep. The next morning, when I woke up, I had forgotten all about what happened the previous night. I left my room and walked into the kitchen, but froze as I did. I noticed that my front door to the house was wide open. I walked over to the garage door and saw that that was open as well. This was extremely creepy to me, because obviously I had closed and locked them the night before. I looked all around the house everywhere, but nobody was there. Somebody had been in my house the previous night. I don't know who they were or how they got in, but I'm just glad they left. Since then, I haven't had any problems. When I was 20, I was home from college for the summer. My best friend who we'll call Kay and her boyfriend had started new jobs. They lived all alone in a house at the top of a really steep hill. Some background on Kay is she has super bad anxiety, and I do as well, but I've become kind of accustomed to living alone and dealing with my anxiety, whereas she had not. Now, there was a back door to their house in the kitchen, and you could fully see into the kitchen from the couch in the living room. At about shoulder height on the door frame outside was a motion sensor light. It should also be known that Kay's backyard is really high up. You have to climb a small set of steps to get into the yard from the small sidewalk in front of the door. It's dug out so that it can reach around to the front of the house. Therefore, the motion sensor light can only be set off by movement on the sidewalk, not any animals in the yard. The yard was very small and there were dense woods all the way down the back of the yard. Kay had been alone and it was her boyfriend's first slash second time on night shift, and she couldn't sleep. Money was tight, so the lights were off to conserve electricity. She suddenly saw a light shining through the kitchen window, and she noticed it was the motion sensor light. She was freaked out, but she tried to ignore it. However, it kept being tripped for varying amounts of time. She called me at about 3 in the morning over and over until I finally woke up. I stayed on the phone with her, even though it had mostly stopped until her boyfriend came home later in the morning. Her boyfriend was off for the next three days, and nothing occurred with the light while he was home. Her dad told her to be vigilant, as it could have been robbers doing a dry run of the house, as there had been some break-ins in the area on the street across from her recently. Therefore, the next time her boyfriend worked the night shift, she asked me to stay the night with her, and I obliged. The night started off fine. We had watched movies until about 11 o'clock. Then we drove to the vape store and McDonald's. Now, we live in the middle of nowhere, so it was about a 40 minute drive each way. We got back at around 12.30 and we blew up the air mattress that we were going to sleep on in the living room. At about 1 a.m., the motion sensor light came back on as we were sitting on the mattress. I then rationalized that it was just an animal maybe a bat or something, but she wasn't convinced. The light went off and came back on again for even longer that time. She then went upstairs to get her boyfriend's gun. The light kept going off as we sat on the couch anxiously. We had the window open so we could hear. Kay then yelled out, 
I have a gun and I'm not scared to use it. She said this is a joke to me to lighten the mood. But then the light went off. It then stayed off for about three hours. Almost if we had chased someone away by saying that. We weren't able to sleep after that experience. And at about 4 a.m., I then went into the kitchen to get myself some water. I turned back to the living room to say something to Kay, who was lying on the mattress. As she looked up at me, she then yelled at me to get back into the room. And when I then turned around, the light was on again. We continued to see the light come on until the sun started to come up. Then out of nowhere, it just suddenly stopped. We considered calling the police, but we were afraid of them thinking that it was a prank call or something, and then getting in trouble. The light never goes off at night whenever her boyfriend's home. I still feel on edge whenever we're alone at night in her house. I believe someone had ill intentions that night. Whether they came to break in and thought it was funny to torment us when they realized the house wasn't empty, or something more sinister. Nevertheless, it was still a nauseating experience. I'm a female, and at the time of this story, I was 17 years old. After I graduated high school, my family and I's house was foreclosed as it was no longer habitable, and it was also under new ownership. We packed up our things and we moved to Robinsonville, North Carolina, where my grandmother's husband had a house in the Smoky Mountains. To understand the layout, when you live on a mountain, your closest neighbor is probably about a mile away. Most of the houses on the street we lived on were either abandoned or we just never saw any other sign of life. I really enjoyed going on little hikes up the mountain all by myself and listening to music. And I also enjoyed leaving my window open during the day so that the natural light and all that mountain air could come into my room. One night while everyone was asleep downstairs, my sister and I were up and awake upstairs in our room when the power goes out. I grab my lantern and I gather some of my colored pencils and paper and I sit on the floor of our bedroom to do some drawing while the power was out as there wasn't anything else to really do. My sister left the room and went to use the bathroom. She had only left the room for just a few moments when I then heard a voice come from the other side of my room. It was a deep voice, clearly from a man, that then said, Hey baby. I froze on the floor, and my eyes then darted over to my closet. Now, I wasn't sure exactly where the voice came from, but everything in me was just screaming that it came from the closet. I sat there frozen for a few moments, completely shook, before I then got up and ran out of my room, slamming the door behind me. This was at about midnight when this happened. I started banging on the bathroom door and my sister came out asking what the hell I was doing and I was kind of scrambling to tell her what had just happened. She was completely freaked out with me and we both went downstairs to my grandma's room to explain what happened. In her half asleep state, she reached under a pillow and gave me her gun and then she shooed us away. Reluctantly, we both went back upstairs and then stayed in the living room the entire night. We didn't sleep at all. We just stayed up playing board games all night long and talking about our high school days. I think that my sister could feel how freaked out I was and wanted to keep my mind off of it. Around 6 a.m., after the power came back and the sun was up, both me and my sister walked into our room and we then saw that the closet door was wide open and so was our bedroom window. Ever since that happened, I've always kept my window locked and my blinds shut until I moved out a few months later. This always gives me the shivers whenever I think about it, because of how unserious it was taken at the time. That man was most definitely inside my room, and he could have easily come out at any point in time and done anything to us. Thank God he didn't, though. So, I'm a big horror fan girl. I'm 20 years old and over the past year, I've been collecting from the figures to the mask to even life size. I won't say this story was terrifying or anything, but to me, it basically saved me. I'll try and make it simple. I'm a big Michael Myers fan and last October I bought a life size figure of him. Oh, and a Chucky doll too. And not just one of the cheap ones, the replica looking ones. 
Some may call me crazy, but what's not to love about horror, right? I keep everything stored away at the moment, apart from the life-size Michael, which he stands around six foot. He's not a cheap-looking guy either. He looks like the real deal. The replica mask, real coveralls with blood, and even a knife too. He stands in my room right next to my bed, and even though it used to creep me out seeing a dark black figure in my room, I eventually got used to it, like to the point where I actually felt comfortable around him. I don't move him anywhere else though, as nobody in the house really liked him. Anyway, now that that's all out of the way, here's the thing that happened. So last year when I received him, I was home alone watching films downstairs when I then heard a thud upstairs. I froze, as I didn't really know what to think. I slowly got up and went up to my room, and then instantly heard the thuds from the downstairs door. I had absolutely no clue what the hell was going on because I was the only one there. I quietly sat in the dark as I didn't keep the lights on, and I listened. I heard what sounded like men talking, and then I realized someone had came in and that I didn't lock the door. The TV was also left on, so they had to have known I was there. Anyways though, there I was sitting face to face with the Michael figure in the dark. I heard the footsteps coming up the stairs to my room while I sat in the corner with my head spinning. I felt like I wanted to pass out. I even started to sweat a little. My door then opened and there I'd seen a hooded figure walk in and head straight towards me. He had something in his hand, something sharp, like a pocket knife. I was leaning against the cold wall more and more, wanting to grab something until out of nowhere, Michael's arm then started moving. Bear in mind, it was still dark, so this guy had no clue that Michael was behind him until he heard it move. I also want to add that it wasn't an electrical noise. It was the material of the arm rubbing together. The man then turned around and instantly yelled. And I mean, I've never seen a man run so fast in his life. The man then started yelling, Go! Get the hell out of here! To some other guy that was in a van outside. I stood up and watched them as they drove off. I then noticed a crack in my window. Obviously these freaks were throwing rocks in my window, possibly to distract me, but I didn't care about that. I turned around and just stared at Michael because I really had no clue that he could even move. I started investigating and then realized he was an animatronic the entire time, but I was thinking he moved just at that exact moment and basically saved my life that night. I can even laugh about it now because of how scared the guy was. I got my window repaired and did mention to the police that I had a break in, but there was really nothing they could do about it, but it was still reported just in case they tried anywhere else. Luckily nothing was taken, as there was really nothing valuable downstairs. Obviously this Michael Myers looks like a real person, and anyone that looks at it, especially in the dark, gets the creeps by it. I know it sounds insane and maybe even funny, but this incident really happened and I'm so damn thankful that I have him in my room. I never even once thought it would save my life like this, especially if he never moved. I always wonder how he moved anyway. I mean, it happened all by itself. Was it some kind of coincidence? I'll never know, but thank you Michael. God only knows what that guy would have done to me if you weren't here.